Ferdinand Marcos, Augusto Pinochet, Wojciech Jaruzelski, Slobodan Milosevic, P.W. Bota. Powerful, ruthless strongmen with one thing in common. Their power was destroyed by nonviolent civil resistance. How were such powerful rulers defeated? It happens when people join together to resist the power of repression. In the Philippines, they called it people power. Usually, it's called civil resistance. It's a nonviolent weapon for ordinary people to use against repressive rulers. Civil resistance requires large numbers of people, but it's not only about numbers. The difficulty with nonviolent efforts is that they don't recognize the necessity of fierce discipline and training, and strategizing, and planning, and recruiting, and doing the kinds of things that you do to have a movement. That can't happen spontaneously. It has to be done systematically. How does it begin? When conditions become intolerable, people organize. Union leaders sometimes take the first step, or human rights groups, or religious organizations, or all of them working together. The main thing in the struggle is to get attention. To struggle in a corner where nobody pays attention to you is a wasteless effort, a useless effort. You've got, if you struggle, to attract as much attention as you can to your cause. At the start, the big problems are apathy and fear, and the perception that an adversary is invincible. In Chile, it took 10 years for the pro-democracy opposition to overcome these obstacles. OK, so how do I organize protests? Public protest can be very effective, but it's a small part of civil resistance, just one of hundreds of tactics. Marches and rallies can be a mistake if you're not ready. It's easy for police and security forces to break up public actions. A few hundred people, or even a few thousand people in the street, are no threat to authoritarian power. Street actions put you and your supporters at risk. Until you've organized a truly mass movement, public actions may only show that you're ineffective or foolish. If not mass protests, then what? You have to decide. The choices are almost unlimited. You talk, debate, and plan. What to do? When? Why? Develop a strategy that ties it all together. Evaluate your risks. Strikes and boycotts can be powerful actions which involve large numbers of people in ways that don't expose them to tear gas, beatings, and arrest. It allowed for the whole community to be participants in the movement. Everyone can be a participant. Children can participate, women can participate, men can participate, young people, old people. Everyone can do the work. In South Africa, Anti-apartheid activists boycotted white businesses. Tens of thousands of customers refused to buy in the main shopping districts. They broke no law. They didn't risk beatings. But when they withdrew their purchasing power, the white business owners paid attention to their grievances, and the businessmen became their allies in demanding change. We don't have a charismatic leader. You don't need a charismatic leader. Only a few civil resistance movements have had leaders like Gandhi or Martin Luther King. There was no such leader in Chile or Serbia or dozens of similar nonviolent success stories. If a movement is too closely identified with a single well-known leader and that prominent leader is arrested, 
the movement may be paralyzed. As far as the police are concerned, and their modus operandi was that, first of all, you tackle the leadership, but we have taken preemptive action by creating numerous layers of leadership. When leaders are dispersed throughout a movement, their names often unknown. It's impossible to arrest them all. The movement continues even when top leaders are removed. This won't work in my country. You may be right. A nonviolent strategy may not succeed against every opponent. Many people doubt that it can work against truly brutal or totalitarian opponents. But the Solidarity Movement in Poland succeeded at a time when 70,000 Soviet troops were stationed there. Pinochet's military junta was defeated. In South Africa, mass action supported by international pressure forced one of the most brutal regimes to negotiate. Civil resistance has succeeded in many situations that seemed hopeless. It was, in fact, mass organization which brought about the change in South Africa. That it was that, form, that mass organization which put pressure on the state to ultimately to change. I mean, that, that brought about the, the stalemate, the impasse where the state could no longer respond. What if my adversary uses violence? You should expect violence. Your adversary is not going to surrender as long as he controls police and security forces. Whatever you impose through violence, you have to defend through violence. That's why we think that violence is the strength of the weak, because they don't have arguments. They don't have moral authority. So whatever you achieve through violence, you have to defend through violence. But violent tactics didn't stop the opposition in Chile, Poland, Serbia, India, and other places. When force is used against nonviolent activists, the result may not be what the authorities intended. The main mistake of, of the regime was that they spread the circle of, of those who were under the repression. That's why this repression was counterproductive, because uh, it is like the third Newton law of action and reaction. When you raise the level of, 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 of repression, the resistance goes up as well. What if my adversary can't be persuaded? Civil resistance is not about persuasion. You are not appealing to your adversary's conscience. Your goal is to raise the cost of repression to the point where it becomes unbearable. Imposing economic costs is one way. Or you can try to disrupt normal life, to demonstrate that the authorities have lost control. When a population loses respect for its rulers, further disobedience and resistance become easier. Ridicule and humor can be effective, making the regime look silly and incompetent. Whatever you do, you need a strategy. If you do this, your adversary might do this and that. And so those are going to be your choices. And why don't you really think about three steps ahead? Why don't you involve some strategy and overall planning in, in your fight? And why don't you try to anticipate what's going to happen in six months from now? This will take too long. We can't wait. Consider the alternatives. You could try armed insurrection, but that requires money, training, and weapons and armed insurrections fail far more often than they succeed. Of course, there are people that think that the only way to face violence is through violence. But that was out of the question. We will never have support for doing that. We will never have the capacity nor you know, the ability to do that. So the only way was through a massive, pacific and organized society. 
You could wait and hope that other countries will impose sanctions or intervene. But you can't control what others do. And you, the people who have the most to gain or lose, can decide for yourselves what to do without waiting for someone else. Civil resistance has a far better record of success than armed struggle. And organizing mass resistance is an inherently democratic process. It's much more likely to produce a democratic outcome. How can I win? Every situation is different. But start with the essentials. You can't win without unity, planning, and nonviolent discipline. Remember the most basic principle. No ruler can rule if people refuse to obey, to go to work, to pay their taxes, to do what's expected. When security forces refuse to obey orders, and their loyalty can be surprisingly weak, no authoritarian can hold power for long. If enough people disobey and disrupt, power shifts, military and police loyalties crack, and change becomes possible. Your goal is to create cracks and then exploit them. How can I learn more? There's a lot to learn. Start with the resources on this website, which has links to others, and many articles, books, and films available in several languages.